All right. Good morning. Um, happy uh, happy Monday morning. Um, so, a few announcements. So, assignment seven I extended to be due on Friday. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to make a video that covers assignment seven any further because um, last week Monday, well, I won't be able to spend live class time on that because I spent about over a half hour on Monday with that. And we're getting kind of uh, close to the end. So I have about maybe six more lectures left to give. Yeah, no problem. Um, I have six more lectures left to give. I have two this week, two next week, and two in that um, Thanksgiving week as well. Now, I know we have a class on Thanksgiving Eve, but it's Wednesday, 8.30 a.m. It's also going to be online as well. So I can't imagine that affecting any travel plans. Or if it does, well, of course, you can watch the video afterwards. It's going to be recorded, of course, the 8.30 a.m. class. This way, it will be kind of in sync because um, my afternoon class in person, I can imagine that being affected. So for Thanksgiving Eve uh, type stuff, so I will, I'll cancel my afternoon class. But the morning one I'll have because we're about one lunch year or so behind for some reason. And this will catch us up. So after we have Thanksgiving, that's going to be, so if we're, if this class is like the Cold War, then Thanksgiving is like the fall of the Berlin Wall. It means that the semester is not officially over, but it's official, it's unofficially over at that point. So it's kind of like that. So basically Thanksgiving is kind of like the unofficial end of the semester because after that we'll have our study week. I'll probably have just maybe that Monday class, but I'll do exam review. And then Wednesday, Either I would sort of either cancel class or I could sort of have an extra Q&A class, like maybe for anybody who wants to me to go over anything in specific. Um, that Wednesday of study week, I can go over extra content, but right now I have six lectures left to give. So I have to cover, um, yes, yeah, so I have, um, I have basically this week I'm going to cover graph theory. This covered after for the first time. The week after that, I'll sort of, um, it's also my want to cover the assignment eight as well this week when it comes out. I'll have to cover assignment nine when it comes out as well. I'll take some class time as well to cover eight and nine, plus basic really graph tree, graph tree traversal, and of course um, uh, Dijkstra's and Crisco's algorithm, which I think I'm trying to make sure I don't run out of time. So if I finish a little early, I can cover some stuff, but I want to make sure I at least don't have to hurry uh, those topics. So I have six more lectures to give, and hopefully I'll be enough time where I can not rush. Uh, through anything and still be able to go through everything thoroughly. So that's kind of my goal right now. So I'll have assignment um, eight up pretty soon. It'll be on uh, priority queues or mean or max heap. And our final homework will be on graph, which I'm going to cover graph theory uh, starting today. So that's going to be our sort of plan for the rest of the semester. So I'll try to make a video if I can um, that covers assignment um, Seven, but I have the video from last Monday's class on WebEx. You can watch that, which I spent about over a half hour covering it. But I could try to make a video if I can. But I'm also doing other things this week as well, which is November is still going to be a, a long month for me as well. But we'll see. But that's kind of the plan for right now. So let's go ahead and just uh, begin a screen share and let's go over sort of uh, graph theory um, content. So for the first time, I think we're well, beginning with this, so I covered heaps for last time. So these notes are all posted, so you can look through that. So I believe, yeah, I don't, I don't have any um, notes here on graph theory, I don't believe. So, okay, I guess graph theory starts now. So let's go ahead and begin. Last uh, data structure uh, for this course, we'll cover a few um, algorithms that cover graph theory for the rest of this uh, semester. So we have three weeks or so, it should be enough time to not hurry anything. So, okay, so let's first just go over, well, I guess sort of um, applications of graph theory, I guess. It's the first thing to start with, essentially. Let's begin with that. So, I mean, the two main ones, of course, like a network is definitely an application of graph theory. Network is basically just a you know a set of machines, computers, or I guess it could be you know IoT or whatever, but they're all computers that are essentially connected to each other by some type of connection, you know, Wi-Fi or wireless or wire, whatever it is, some connection between different machines that pass data. So each uh, node in your network is like a computer, a server, a router, 
smartphone, whatever, those are all nodes and network, then their connections to a different machine connecting to a, either to a to a cell phone tower or to a router or to whatever, that's sort of a connection in networks. So network is the example, a great example of a of a for a graph. Also, I guess like a map, like different cities or streets and intersections could be also a graph. So there are two main examples I can think of. And of course, there are other problems you can probably can reduce to a graph theory, but I can't think of any off the top of my head right now. But those are two main large um, examples of graph theory. So a graph basically, mathematically, is defined as following. So a graph is always G, and then we have B, E. So a graph is always defined in terms of this sort of set of V and E, where V is going to be, V is um, a set of vertices, and then E is a set of edges, and then an edge is a pair of vertices. And sometimes I'll use the word nodes instead of vertices. They're interchangeable. So vertices, nodes, same, same difference. So mathematically, graph is defined like this. Let's go ahead and first draw an example graph here on the board just to kind of get an idea of what a graph really is. So you might have learned this maybe in your math class, but maybe not. If you haven't taken discrete one, maybe you haven't learned this yet, but you know, here's our opportunity to learn graph theory right now. So let's go ahead and um, create a graph over here. We have a few nodes, I suppose. Let's have a couple of nodes in this graph. has several that's okay though this will be just fine and i'm going to draw connections so each circle is going to be um, um sort of a node or vertex and look i drew a bow tie right there of course so anyway um yeah that i guess this will be good a good example of a of a graph so pretty much, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll label these. So I'm going to have maybe just a uh, B, C, D, e, F, and G. So each circle is going to be a node slash vertex, and a line that connects to um, nodes is going to be an edge. So edge is basically just a connection. So it tells you what nodes are connected together in this graph slash network slash um, Apps. Each node can be a city with airplane, you know, sort of airplanes flying between cities. There could be, and a node could be a intersection, and edges are just, you know, you can go left, right, or straight. So different types of paths you can take at intersections. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, some simple examples of a graph. So here, in this case, well, V would be the following set. It would just be essentially just A, B, C, D, E, F. And G. It's going to be your set of vertices in this graph. So you have that. And then E would be essentially, uh, so you have A goes to C, A, E, A, D. Let's see what else we have. We have uh, B, C, B, E. BF. Let's see what else we have. Let's look at C. So C has uh, G, C, G. We have um, EF. We have DE. Does that get everything? Two, three, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh. I miscounted. I think that's correct. I think it's the right, right amount. But anyway, as we kind of go a little faster here, but I believe that's all of the edges that I accounted for. I believe I, I think I have everything here. So let's just count one more time. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I have nine. Okay. So basically, um, this is how we can actually um, store a graph, basically. So we have the list of all of the um, 
all the uh, nodes or vertices, the names of the vertices, and then we have these connections. So um, if you were to actually read a, read a graph from a file, like for an assignment, you'd have, you know, maybe um, the first line or you'd have maybe a number tells you how many uh, vertices you have, and then you have these vertices listed out, and then you have just each line would just be just a pair of two vertices, which would just tell you um, what it connects to what, basically. So you have just a number, tells you how many vertices, then a list of the vertice names, and then you have several lines of just edges. Is there 10 in this case? Let me take a look. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, oh, 10. So I'm missing something then. B goes to C. F goes to G. Okay. Thank you. There you go. Thanks for the uh, assist. So, so anyway, so that's going to be our sort of set of edges right there. So in any sort of graph program we'll use for this class, that'll be always the input a number telling us how many vertices, a list of the vertices names, and then we have several lines afterwards, which just be a pair of two vertices, which tells us our connections. So we can kind of can construct a graph essentially, but we'll go over how to store a graph memory later, but that's sort of just our beginning right there. Now this example, this is going to be an example of um, undirected graph. So for this graph, um, each edge has no actual direction, which means that in this case, A goes to C and C goes to A. So every edge is a two-way edge, basically, if it's undirected graph. Now for um, actual coding a graph, you can't use undirected graph really because it becomes, well, you could, but then you have to find a way to represent it. I guess you could do like that. But anyway, we'll be usually for our assignments, we'll go over usually directed graphs, but for some of these conceptual problems involving graph theory, we'll go over undirected graph, but typically um, for most applications, um, you're gonna have a directed graph usually, but for theoretical examples, you use undirected. So this is a case where you have every, um, every edge basically um, has two directions. Let's go ahead and do an example of a directed graph. So I'm going to just simply copy this graph and make some modifications to it. It's not the redraw all of that. So this will save a little bit of time. Good enough. And I'll have the following. So I'm going to put arrows here, which is going to basically tell us that um, each of these has a direction. Also, I'm going to go ahead and put another line over here as well. Like that. Also make another as well like this. Yeah, I think that's gonna work. This is gonna be an example of a directed graph. Because in this example, um, every edge has a direction, an arrow. So the following graph, we see between B and C, for example. So C goes to B but B does not go to C, so that's only a one-way edge. Now, if I want to have, I want to be able to create sort of an undirected graph using directed, then I have to sort of use two edges for every single sort of between every pair of nodes. So for example, uh, for A to E and E go to A, I have to have two edges, one that goes in left to right direction, one that goes from right to left in order to sort of um, simulate this um, um, graph to be um, undirected in a sense. So you have to have two edges for every uh, pair of nodes if you want to have a two-way connection for directed graph. So, um, so for like some conceptual concepts, uh, conceptual ex examples we'll do in this class, we'll use undirected. But for the assignment, we're going to use directed because it is uh, a bit more, I guess, more realistic, I suppose. So anyway, that's an example of a directed graph. Now I'll also draw out, um, also write out the um, vertices as well. So we're going to have A, B, C, D, F, B. I'll list out the edges again. Just I'm going to try to not mess this up. So we'll have A go.
goes to E. We're also going to have E goes to A because, well, we can see here, for a directed graph, the order of these um, edge pairs, this pair of vertices in the edge list, does matter. So A goes E strictly, and then E goes to A as well. Then here we have A goes to D, which means strictly that A goes to D, but does not imply that D goes to A. And then, of course, let's look at the rest of these. I'll try to not mess these up. I'll try to do them kind of more chronologically from left to right. So you have D goes to E. Then uh, E goes to F. B goes to E. Then uh, yeah, I missed A went to C. And then we'll have F goes B goes to G, G goes to C, goes to F. Um, if I missed anything, let me know. Make this look a little bit more nicer so that I can see. Um, hope I didn't miss anything here. But basically, um, this is sort of how we can represent this uh, directed graph, where every sort of line of the of the input file would just contain a pair of nodes, and then the um, element to the in the left. So, for example, here we have um, a a goes to e. That represents that a goes strictly to e, like that. If it's if it's um, undirected, then that really implies that a goes to e and e goes to a. So that one sort of line represents sort of two um, two edges, basically sense but um for um directed graph it's you have this strictly you have these uh, directions so the left uh, node in that pair is your source and the right node is destination of that edge so that's basically um that so um two kinds of graphs right there and um let's go over sort of two ways of um representing a graph here directed and under undirected we also have um two other examples I'll cover. So you also have a, a connected graph and an unconnected graph. So I'll talk about these as well. Just because. So something like this. We have, let's say, following. I'll probably actually understand. I copy and paste this to the other side as well. So a graph like this would be considered connected. Wow, that's that came out really weird. I guess let's just skip it back then. So it could be um, direct or indirect, doesn't really matter. But the idea here is that this is all, everything is sort of connected to each other. Everything is sort of, they're all, I guess um, every node is kind of, they're, they're one connected graph essentially. So it's hard to explain this in, in words, but this is, um, this example here is unconnected. Something like this. We have these two components that are not connected to each other. So this would be still one graph. It's not going to be two graphs, it's one graph, but there's two components that are not um, connected to each other, which could happen in a graph. It's, I mean, it's possible. So uh, for, I guess, uh, for assignments in general, I'm not going to really use this example, but I'll go over uh, some code when we go over graph traversals as to how to handle if a graph does have, if a graph is um, unconnected like this, but that's just really, um, how much more say in the fact that yeah, just, you know, it's not one one big component. We have these components that are not connected, and it's all part of one graph. Okay, so I guess that's really all there is to the the basics of uh, graph theory. So now the first oh, actually first step we want to look at over here, or the first important detail is well, how do we actually store a graph into a computer? Because you want to write code to traverse a graph, do some operation on a graph. So I'm gonna scroll for a second so we look at an example. Let's look at this graph right here. So, okay, 
we can kind of see the graph here on the board, but we have to be able to, you know, store this graph into memory so a computer algorithm can actually, you know, process a graph. So how do we actually um, do that? Well, let's go ahead and sort of go over these two types of uh, structures. I'm going to actually copy this graph because since, you know, I already drew this earlier, why repeat this? I'll go ahead and just reuse this graph right here. Um, store graphs. Let's go over um, storing a graph into memory. So there's actually two ways. One's going to be an adjacency matrix. Other way is going to be adjacency list. Now, hmm. well, I guess before I even go over this, I have to cover other, one more content I have to cover first. So let me go ahead and move these notes down for a second. I have to cover one more topic actually, before I can even go into this. So, okay, that's, this will not take too long. Is that a little further? Let's see, let me go further even than this. My mistake, I have to cover one small topic first before I even cover uh, this. So the next one I have to cover is going to be um, sort of a sparse graph. And of course I'll cover a dense graph. So I'll leave a little space for these two. That's good enough. So uh, a sparse graph. So Lehman's term for a sparse graph is just that it's a graph with not um, a lot of edges. It's a very scientific term, actually. Think about that. It's, I mean, write a thesis, that's definitely, you can use that phrase, and it makes a lot of sense. Nobody would question that. So that's a layman's terms for what it is, which is, you know, you want to think of it like this, but, you know, of course, you want to maybe more mathematically explain this. So a sparse graph really means the following. So it means that um, this property has to hold. And I'll go over what this means in a second. Okay. So this right here does not mean absolute value of V. It's actually cardinality of V. So E is a set. So if you take a discrete math, you would know that if you haven't taken discrete math, then I guess you'll notice right now. So E is a set. So the cardinality is the amount of elements in a set. So for example, let's go up to the um, notes you have here. So for this example, the cardinality of E would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 um, edges in this, um, in this set. And the cardinality of V would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I mean, I could actually, you know, do it. I could talk like that guy from Sesame Street, that vampire, and do that right now, but that would be very cringy. But that's really, you just, you know, one, one vertex. I'm, I'm not doing that voice right now. I did it once to somebody, and they were, like, really surprised, like, how good it came out. They were, like, shocked, and I don't want to do it right now. And <laughs> come across as really cringy. So I'm just going to just say for now, you just count how many elements are in. <laughs> I'm not going to do it right now. I mean, I'll do it later. On the last day, maybe, or some other time. I don't want to get sidetracked with that right now. So anyway, uh, so anyway, so basically here, um, the idea is that this has to hold. So the cardinality of V has to equal O of cardinality of, of V. So this means that the amount of edges is going to be linear with respect to the amount of vertices. The amount of edges um, is linear with respect to the amount of vertices. So it has a linear relation, basically. So if you have um, V number of uh, vertices, you can have uh, five times V edges or 10 times V edges, but you have a linear amount of edges with respect 
to the number of vertices. So that means you don't have too many edges. You have just enough to connect the graph, or maybe a little more, but the idea is you don't have a lot of them. A dense graph, well, here's some more technical definition of this. It's a graph with a lot of edges. Again, very technical because that makes sense. But anyway, you want to think of it in that kind of way. So that's how you want to think about it. But of course, you know, in terms of math and science, you have to write things as complicated as possible so nobody can understand what's being said. But that's what it really means, a dense graph. It's just a lot of edges, basically. So we can think about this. I have to make a little more space here again. So I say I have to make a little more space just to cover this. Down a little bit more. Actually, enough space. Okay, perfect. So now, uh, for dense graph, it basically means one way to think about this is that at most you, you're gonna have so in the worst case the the max number of edges edges is um, when a vertex B um, connects to all other vertices in the graph, or to every vertex except itself, basically. So it's all vertices that's not including itself, basically. I should write it a little different. I think if I see all, every other, then maybe you gonna think the alternate, but no, it's so it connects to all to all vertices in the graph, not including uh, V or itself. So if you have um, a directed graph, so for directed graphs, This amount would actually would be V, cardinality of V, multiplied by the cardinality of V minus one is the amount you would have. That's how, if you were to count this. So looking at one vertex, it connects to all the other vertices, not including itself. So if you count that, that's gonna be the amount of total edges you're going to have. You know, right like this, actually, I'm gonna move this over just a little bit. So this would be the actual the cardinality of E would be essentially this, which is going to basically be O of, write this out, should I write this in this color pen? I'll write like this, just for now. It's O of V squared. For um, undirected, then the cardinality of E would be the cardinality of V, multiply it by cardinality of V minus one, divided by two. Because um, for undirected, if A goes to B, you have to make another edge from B going to A, because it's already included from A goes to B. So you'll have to have half the number of edges because not every, because you already included that. So for directed, you actually have to have, if A goes to B, then we have to have an edge from B going to A as well. Undirected though, you don't have to worry about that because that one edge is going to really be two edges in a sense because it has a two-way sort of path, two-way direction. So you have half of them, but either way though, it's going to still be B squared. So for dense graph, it means that a cardinality is going to be B squared. So in this case, the amount of edges will be quadratic with respect to the number of vertices. I'll write that here, I have to move this down one more time, but at least, you know, it's a benefit of one, I can just move things down just like that. So this really means that um, the amount of edges edges is quadratic 
with respect uh, to amount of vertices. So basically, we have a graph, either sparse or it's dense. Sparse means not many edges, dense means a lot of edges. Really a simple way of thinking about this, but of course I define it mathematically-ish over here, so that way there's an actual, more of a technical way of explaining this than just saying that, you know, it's just that way it's more of a, more of a scientific explanation of what these are, but really that's all there is to it. Dense is a lot, sparse is not so many. That's pretty much the best way of thinking about this. I mean, think of the word dense, dense, and dense kind of means something, right? So dense means that it's, it's, it's dense. That's, that was terrible. Let's move on to do the next part over here. But we know what the word dense kind of means, I suppose. And sparse, you know, means not so many. So that's the best way of thinking about that as well. Um, okay, so now that we have those two out of the way, now let's go over actually storing graph into memory. So we have a latency matrix, a latency list. So a latency matrix is just going to be just a matrix structure. And latency list is going to be and array of linked lists. Obviously, I can imagine that everybody would like to use um, a latency matrix instead for their assignments because that's sort of, you know, I think people prefer a matrix over a list. But of course, we're going to use um, a latency list for our assignments because, of course, you have to make things, you know, painful as possible in CS. You can't make things easy on anybody ever, so we have to go with the one that's the harder one to implement. But there actually is more to it than just this one's harder or easier. I mean, conceptually, they're both equally as difficult. It's just, I guess, coding it. If you're not used to, um, if you're not used to linked lists, then um, obviously it's kind of, I'd be a little bit tougher. And which one's better? Well, we'll, we'll go over that. So we'll, we'll get there. We'll explain. Depends on if the graph is sparse or dense is the actual answer to this. But we'll go over that in a second, though. So. Let's go ahead and just uh, copy that graph from above or from earlier. And I'm going to create an adjacency matrix out of this. So we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, vertices. I cannot do the, uh, that. So I'm just going to say it normal. Six and seven. I'm going to make it. That's wide enough. Okay, excellent. And we're going to need uh, six lines. So I'll try to make this somewhat as straight as possible. I'll try at least. So it's three. line there we are I guess the um, there are also there are lines already in this uh, in this notebook so I'll have to draw horizontal lines so I'm going to use um, these um, vertex names as uh, indices for right now so put it as well Yeah, I'll separate these a little bit so you don't get confused with the uh, matrix and the actual graph. So I'll move it down a little bit just so it's out of the way. Yeah, so we don't get confused by that. Then I'll zoom out so we can see all of this. <clears throat> so all we're going to do in this example is we're going to just store every connection. So let's look at this. So A has an edge from A to C. So I'm going to just uh, mark this as true. A has an edge that goes to D. And it has an edge that goes to E. So I'll mark these as true. And then these will be uh, false. So there's no edge from A to B, A to F, or A to G. Now, what about from A to A? Well, that's kind of, I guess, up to the application at hand. So 
if let's say there was an actual edge that goes from A to itself, then sometimes you have to have that and then in order to have an edge from A to itself. So you have to have that in a graph. But also you can think of it as well, if you're already at node A, you're already there. So who cares if there's an edge from A to itself? So it depends. Sometimes you actually have to literally have an edge that goes to itself in order to mark that spot. There are some applications where you actually have to have that. But for most part, though, if you're already at A, you're already there. So there's no need to really uh, maintain that. So I'll put dashes here. These will be just simply open. We don't really, this is going to be just an open concept right now. So that could be whatever application you're working on depends. But for now, we'll just leave those as open. Let's go ahead and fill the rest of these out. So B goes only directly to E, I believe. It has incoming neighbors, but B, only outgoing neighbor, is going to simply just E, I believe. And the rest will be marked as false. Looking at C. Um, C has only one outgoing neighbor going to B, I believe. And the rest are going to be false, which means that there is no edge in this graph. So if looking at, so we read this matrix in the following way, the row and then column. So I want to see, is there an edge from C to B? Well, I look at row C, column B, the crosshairs contains a true. That means there is an edge from C to B. If I want to see, is there an edge from C to D? Well, cross here, crosshairs over there. Uh, C and D contains uh, false, which means that there is no edge from C to D. That's how we read it. So the row is our source, and the column next will be your des destination. So is there an edge from this source to that destination? That's how we read this uh, matrix. Not too hard, I don't think, but just to make that clear. So D has only one edge going directly to E, and the rest, I'll mark them as false means there is no edge it's in our graph. Then E goes um, to A and to F, I believe. The rest will be false, means there is no um, edge between those two nodes. F goes to B and uh, goes to node G, I believe. So we're going to have B will be marked true, and D will also be marked true as well. And the rest will be marked as false. And then last one, G goes to C and F, if I'm not mistaken. So C and F, and the rest are going to be false. So this is going to be the adjacency matrix for the given graph. So this will be the adjacent uh, C matrix for this graph. So, I mean, really, to store a graph in memory, all we have to have is a structure that's going to basically uh, represent every edge. So, an edge is just a pair of two nodes. So, this matrix really maintains every possible connection. See here, look at the row and then column will give us sort of the um, edge from node X to node Y, basically. So, row and then column helps you read this off, essentially. So there we are, we have a JNC matrix. Let's go over the JNC um, list equivalent, and then we can go ahead and sort of compare and contrast and see which one is the better one to use and so forth. So once again, we have a six node or seven node graph. So I'm going to um, following shape. So I'm going to have We're going to have the same. Um, try this again. I think I made a mistake. It's going to be seven. So one, two, three, six, and seven. Ah. And uh, currently, we're going to have the following. We have just an array of linked lists. So we're going to have the following uh, structure initially. So each of these elements 
each element is going to be just a linked list. So we're going to have, so both of these will be a two star pointer essentially, because they're both going to be a pointer that points. So we can have the, uh, so a matrix is a two star pointer. And then this will be also two star because the first star the references an element in this list. And a second pointer will reference the head node of, of each linked list. But we'll go over, um, I guess we'll talk about that in a second as well. But basically, they're both gonna be two star pointers, basically. You wanna point to these structures. So over here, A goes to um, C and E. So we have the following uh, setup. C and E. So we're maintaining all neighbors of A. So I'll first I'll draw this whole thing out and then we'll talk about it in a second. So I mean, I'm gonna read off of the matrix instead to make it faster. So oh, actually there's one more kind of chance also D as well. Okay, fine, I'll just, I'll do an alphabetical order, I guess. So probably consistent with that. So A, so C, D, and E, okay. Stay. There we go. And then B has only one outgoing neighbor going to E. And then C goes only to B. D only, okay, so C only, so then D only goes just to E, I believe. E goes to um, A and F, just so two neighbors. And F goes to B and G. And the last one, so G has C and F. Okay, it's done. So C and F. There we are. So, so this will be an adjacency matrix for the for the graph above. So let's go ahead and look at both. Let's try to look at the actual graph as well. See if I can zoom out enough where it's still all visible. Let's see, hopefully it's still um, viewable on WebEx. So here's our graph. Put the word graph above over here. This is our graph. Jason C matrix, Jason C list. Oops, C list. My mistake. This is below. There we go. So basically, um, either of these two structures, they're going to you know, store the graph, no problem. And we can write any type of graph traversal algorithm using either structure. So I guess the first thing you might notice is that the matrix for this example is kind of a bit wider, a bit more larger looking than the list version, if you look at this. So if you look, we have a lot of red um, sort of uh, markings in our matrix, we have a lot of falses. So a false means there's no edge between those two uh, nodes in our graph. So then, okay, one question is, why do we even have to maintain all that? Because we have to actually allocate the uh, space just to store that, yeah, there is no uh, sort of uh, edge. It's like in episode of South Park, I'm not gonna mention the name of this character, but what happened was that Mr. Garrison was teaching in class is asking, you know, who knows the answers to this? And I want a character to raise his hand and said, I don't know. Like, you, you don't raise your hand if you don't know. So I'm not gonna mention the name of that character because it might not be appropriate in academia to say that. But the idea is that 
Oh, geez. Okay. So, um, so basically, I can't, I can't, I can't focus now. Okay. So anyway, now the thing is that, um, you don't have to, you know, store all these falses into this structure because you're wasting space with all that. Why, why store a false? So for this graph right there, this is definitely a sparse graph because let's look at the, um, looking up here for a second. Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven edges, sorry, vertices, I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, so you have seven vertices and 10 edges. So this is about sparse as you can get really because you don't have a quadratic number of um, edges in this case, not so many. So this graph here is definitely a sparse graph, which means that, well, the list version, you're not going to have to maintain all these possible connections because why have all these falses allocated? There's no point. So for list version, we don't maintain all that. And also just to also make sure we're clear about this. If I have an edge in, in this uh, link list, this sort of pointer, C goes to D and D goes C does not imply that C has an edge that goes to D. This is just all the neighbors of A. So A has an edge that goes to C, A goes to D, and A goes to E. Those are the neighbors of A, the outgoing neighbors of A. So all those nodes does not mean that, that doesn't imply that they're connected to each other in the graph. It just, those, those are all the neighbors of a node. So for example, even for E, its neighbor is gonna be A and F. Those are two neighbors of E in our graph. So the idea here, for this version, you don't have to maintain all of these um, edges that are false because why even have that? So you save a little space uh, for a sparse graph if you use an adjacency list. That's kind of the benefit of a list over a matrix. We go ahead and write these notes down and then we can go up and can go ahead and zoom back out so you can see all this, but I'm gonna first write some notes down over here. First note is if um, the graph is sparse, then, then we use an adjacency list to um, store the graph um, in order to save memory. because you don't have to um, maintain a bunch of extra sort of connections that are false anyway. You don't have to be that character from South Park that would raise his hand and say that he does not know the answer. There's no point doing that. It's kind of silly. So you have to do all that. So for sparse graph, it's a better idea. I mean, really, you can actually use that matrix to store a sparse graph. I mean, look, we have a sparse graph right here, and I use a matrix to store it. So we can use a matrix. It's not illegal to do this. It's just that if you want to save memory, then we can see list is a better idea to store a sparse graph. If you want to save memory, if you don't care memory, then I guess then it doesn't really matter. But if you want to save memory, go with the uh, list version. And if the graph is dense, then um, either structure saves um, memory over the other. Now, this might be bad grammar, but what I mean is that it doesn't matter which one we choose them. Either way, we're going to have to have a lot of nodes in our list if we have agency list being used. So then there's no real memory safe in that scenario. So then I guess, um, sort of, I guess, um, maybe give a um, sort of maybe maybe lean towards um base and c matrix question mark as in 
I guess if it's if it's a dense graph, then you can't really save memory anyway. So then the matrix might be a better idea because it is an easier structure to maintain over um, an adjacency list. So I guess give a slight nod towards the matrix if you do have a dense graph. But either way though, whether it's dense or sparse, either structure will work. It's just that if you really want to save memory as a sparse graph, well, you can save memory if you use the DNC list because otherwise you're gonna have sort of a V by V sort of structure with a lot of falses in them, which is a lot of waste spot here. We're not gonna have a V squared number of nodes if we have a DNC list. But for matrix, it'll be V squared number of elements regardless if the graph is sparse or dense. But matrix or set list version could have V number of nodes or some o, o of v number of nodes in this structure, which is better than having o of v squared, which you're gonna have regardless in a matrix. And also, I guess one benefit of matrix is that, well, if you wanna see if an edge from node x to y exists, you can in constant time, you can just instantly find it by just going to row x, column y, check that crosshair. If it contains true, there's an edge. For this version, you have to go to row X and then traverse all those nodes until you finally see the node Y somewhere in that linked list, which is a little slower. But typically, for different graph applications, yeah, the matrix will be fixed size, it'll be V by V. Now, of course, you could have a jagged matrix, so have a vector of vectors that you can have it, so you have a jagged amount, you'll push back every single time. So you can emulate sort of this um, adjacency list using a jagged matrix could also be used as well, which is probably the most preferred way for students. But of course, we can't, you know, make stuff easy like that on us. But that could be one alternative. We have this matrix where each sort of row has a different number of columns. But then you have to actually store the actual, so that means then the column index is going to be ir irrelevant. You have to actually store the um, destination node inside of each element of that matrix if you do it in that kind of fashion. So you're really just emulating this list as a jagged array. So the natural column will have no use at that point. It would just be whatever stored inside of that um, element would tell you the destination of that edge. So, um, so anyway, so the idea is that no matter what you do, most graph theory applications uh, you have to actually traverse through all of the neighbors of every edge either way. So it's not very often we're going to say, well, is there an edge between B and F? Well, you're not going to really ever use that to, I mean, maybe, but some of the uh, most common graph theory traversals, you have to iterate through all the neighbors of a node regardless. So really, that will not save you time. So it's mostly saving space. So if you want to save space, this version is going to be better if you have a sparse graph. If it's a dense graph, then neither one of them will save space. So then use whichever one you want to use. I'm guessing prime matrix is more preferred then because simpler structure to maintain. Yeah, so even with the matrix, you still have to iterate using a loop. You go through all the neighbors of every single node regardless because there are moments you can maybe just say, is there an edge between you know C to D, but typically you're going to have to traverse anyway. So then there's no real time saver to use a matrix over a list. See, I see a question. Yes, so a good, good thought right there. So one question is, could you have a hash map that maps onto each coordinate of the matrix so you don't have to iterate? Now, you could, but then you have a lot of hash maps. So a hash map will be used actually to store doesn't see list, but not in that kind of fashion because um, because I guess what would happen is you have a hash map. So let's say for A, B, C, D, E, and F, and it would map to an array of all these neighbors. So you could do something like that, but you still have to iterate through neighbors. I mean, I don't see, because let's say we have three neighbors, you have to look at each of them individually. So there's no way you can really enhance that, but you have to do hash map at times. If I say it's nodes, are not um, indices or single letters, you have to hash it to a to an element 
in this matrix or to this list. But the idea is that you can't really enhance that part because you have three neighbors, you got to store those three neighbors somehow. So, so if you look up th the three neighbors of a node, let's say, for example, for node A, you have to look at its three neighbors, basically. So you have to do three iterations, basically, to check each neighbor. So I think that part you can't really enhance, but a hash map is used to map a vertex to its neighbors list. So, so for assignment nine, we'll probably do something like that. So assignment nine, you have to use your assignment seven hash map, or you can use unword map for assignment nine. So it might be some bonus, maybe some extra credit, maybe if you're able to use your unordered, no, use your hash map from assignment seven for nine, if you can't get that, that to work, then of course, unordered map, you can use that. So I don't wanna have to like, I don't wanna have like, you know, um, get a double penalty, I guess, if you could get assignment seven to work perfectly with hash maps, the hash map class. But anyway, that'll be later. We'll go over that once you cover assignment nine. But anyway, that's sort of the uh, basic ways of storing. Um, yeah, there you go. It always sounds nice. Extra credit is never a bad thing, I guess. As how Mrs. Puff always says it, like, what did she say one time? What's the escape? You know, wait. Extra credit is sort of, wait, I feel like SpongeBob in episode was saying that, I don't think I really did anything in the Mrs. Puff was saying that, well, that's how extra credit is supposed to feel like. You didn't actually do any extra work and you got more points. Or, I, I forgot the episode of SpongeBob. It was one of those episodes where um, extra credit was sort of involved and that's extra credit. So, so the one escape from instructors to get out of a jam, extra credit is the one way to get out of a jam, I guess, if you're an instructor, that's a joke. So. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, assignment nine will have a great opportunity. If you get hash map to work on, on, on homework nine, then you get some extra points uh, for that. So that basically just um, concludes the very basic preliminary of graphs. So what is a graph and how we can store a graph into memory. So now we're gonna go over, have a little bit of time here. Let's go over how do we actually write, you know, how do we traverse a graph? So let's go over the very first basic graph traversal, which will be depth first search or depth first traversal. Let's go ahead and add a page here. And I'm going to write this. This will be depth first search. If I can spell search, that'd be nice. And uh, Let's go ahead and write some notes on this. So it's um, a very basic graph traversal. And I mean, it's called depth first search or DFS for short. It's not really, I mean, I guess it can be used for a search, I suppose, but it's not really a specific search, it's just a traversal. So it's known as depth first search or DFS, but it's just a traversal, basically. It's um, a recursive function. Of course, we know how much we love recursion. So of course it's recursive, but it's not really too bad. So it's really going to be just a pre-order traversal extended onto graphs. Remembering a uh, pre traversal back we did binary trees, well, it's gonna be just like that, except it's going to involve a larger, a more complicated tree, which is a graph. So really, a tree is a specific form of a graph. A graph is more generic, a tree is more specific type of graph. So really, it's like pre-order, except that it's gonna be just a little bit different from pre-order. So for depth first search, we have the following sort of, we have the following, I guess, uh, parameters we're gonna have to use. So parameters needed. I like this a little better. Needed. Or maybe not even parameters, but I guess, um, variables needed, but I'll say parameters for right now, sure. So basically, we can think 
of the following. So we're going to have um, a struct. We'll have a struct node, I suppose. So maybe I'll put this. So to actually store a JSONC list out of the following. So I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll put this. I'll move this down for a second. So I'll write this over here. So each node in the JSONC list we had earlier, we're going to have maybe a struct node. And we're going to have maybe, I'll use integers for now. We have int um, ID and node star link. So each node in our JSONC list will be of type node. So each node has an ID. We'll use ints for this example, not, not characters. So int, so in this case, we go back to the um, previous notes. Each node, so the ID will be C, but this node ID will be C. C is a value. So I, I use characters here, but it could be any type, be template basically. So this will be just, we can use integers to store destination um, sort of uh, vertice IDs. And then you have a link to the next element in this link list. So you can think of it like that. So we're going to have the following. So of course, we're going to have, um, we're going to have node star star JSON C list. So it's going to be an array of link lists. So basically you can think of it like this. So a JSON C, all right, I'll write this here for a second. JSON C list index zero, let's say, is really going to be back in our notes over here, it's going to be this first element in my link list. A JSON C list index one is going to be this element. And then this element points to a head node of its own individual link list. So each element, JSON C list zero, one, two, three, are going to be each will be its individual link list. So this will be just simply a head pointer. This will be a head pointer, basically. Of that link list at that index. So each of these, if you can see list zero, in index one, two, three, whatever, those will all be head pointers of each individual link list. But I'll, I'll go over this in detail in a second. Or when I, maybe not today, because I'm not going to change the example probably, but I'll trace it out and we'll see that. And of course, we're going to have an int, some type of a current uh, node ID. So what one node we're currently on in our traversal. So you have to know where we are currently. So this is the equivalent. Remember we had that um, bin tree node star R? Well, R the pointer to which node we're currently on in our tree traversal. So in current node ID is going to be some index of my JSONC list that tells me which node I'm currently processing right now in my traversal. And then we're going to have our bool star visited. This marks which nodes we've seen so far and which nodes you have not seen so far. So true for any element implies that we've seen that node before and false means we have not seen that node before. Because if you've already been to that node once, we don't want to go back again because it could be more than one way to reach a node. So we're kind of going in circles potentially if we are trying to go back to a node we've already seen before. So we want to mark which nodes you've seen before so you don't go back there again because then we're it's redundant at that point. There's no point. We've already been there. Why go there again? Why process and expand that node again? So that's what we're gonna to have to use. And in depth first search, so um, depth first search, which is known as DFS. Um, basically um, traverses the graph. It goes as it is, so it's going to it um, goes as deep 
as possible when a dead end is reached it backs up back it backs backs up the previous node backs up to the previous node and um, explores a different neighbor. So the way this works is um, we're going to try to remember the quote by Yogi Berra, who's a famous Yankees uh, player, where if there's a fork in the road, take it, which I guess means the following. So let's say we're um, traversing this graph and we're at a node and it has multiple edges. So the question is, which edge should we take? And the answer is yes, which means just take any edge and just and then just don't look back basically, just take an edge. And at a certain point, we hit a node and we can't go anywhere. We hit a dead end. That happens, we go back to the previous node we came from and try a different edge. That's about really all there is to EFS. Of course, the code is obviously a little intimidating because it's of course graph theory and recursion. But basically, that's all a DFS really is. So just keep on going, take, a, take an edge, just keep going as far as possible as you can in the graph. Then we hit a dead end, you back up and try a different path. So it's really just like pre order or how pre order worked. We went as, went, we went left as far as possible, we backed up and tried to go right. So it's really just the same idea, except more of an extension on graphs. Now, also, I'll maintain one more structure as well, just to you know cover this as well when I do my cover at DFS. I'll move this down for a second. We're gonna maintain one more structure, which is going to be our, I guess, um, int uh, star predecessors. This array is gonna be used to maintain every node's predecessor so we can construct the path that DFS took to, so when we actually do DFS, we traverse the graph, we want to construct the path DFS took when it was traversing um, edges. So I wanna know what's the path from node, uh, start node S to node A, the start node S to node B and so forth. So we wanna know what's the actual path. So this is, I like recursive backtracking, except that it's not going to be exponential runtime, though. But this is kind of how you can think of a backtrack, but also think of it in terms of um, pre or traversal on a graph. But it is sort of a simple ish, except backtracking would mean you try to find every possible path, which is exponential in runtime. This is like a more efficient way of that, but I guess it's kind of like uh, backtracking. You could think of it like that. And um, and a predecessor array will use it. We'll go over how to use this array to construct the actual path from a start node. So from a start node to a different node in our graph. So let's go ahead and just kind of begin writing this DFS. I'm, I'm not going to be able to finish it today, but let's go over the actual DFS code. So it'll be a void function. Well, the first thing I'll do is the following. We first um, allocate. Um, each um, array um, with size v. So how many verses you have, you make sort of an array visited, adjacency list, and predecessors will be an array of size v. And in adjacency list, you add nodes into each um, index. And then you're gonna mark, so visited, mark every element so mark each element in visited array to uh, false. And I guess, you know, mark each element in 
predecessor array to can we think I, I think this is some type of some type of um, generic value that represents uh, nothing. So I can't really think of an actual value. Uh, maybe um, if it's integer, a uh, sort of um, ID is a negative one. Maybe it's some type of a way to mark it that it's sort of a blank, basically, is what you want to do. And of course, you're going to assign a node into each linked list, into each respective linked list to actually create the adjacency list. You first, of course, you're going to then, you know, um, add um, each node into adjacency list for each edge. So um, I'll go over, when you have assignment nine, I'll go over how to actually construct this, but it's not too bad. I'll go over how to construct this so that way we have an idea of how to construct this using code. So then I'll go ahead and I'll just write the DFS part out here and I'll continue this more next time. But our function we call the void DFS for depth first search. Now it's not really a search per se, but it's a traversal type. We're going to pass in the following elements. I'll pass in maybe int uh, cur for a current. Then I'll pass in node star star adjacency list star visited. I guess I'll then I'll have right below int star predecessor. Now before I even do this, I'm gonna have to actually write my code in main first. It's gonna call DFS. Move this down a little bit. But actually way down. I'm going to continue this some more next time. So let me just move this down way down over here for a second. And I'll write so I'll write the int main portion right here. I'll just write int main for right now. I guess I'll go ahead and I'll continue this some more next time. So that's it for today. We are we are out of time actually. So I'll post the notes on Graphity. I'll post these notes once I kind of finish up DFS next time. But for right now, take care, you guys. Stay safe. Thanks for watching. Have an awesome rest of your day. And I'll see you guys uh, next time.